Welcome to the Feisty Women's Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gross, Ironman champion, PhD in women's history, and founder and CEO of Feisty Media. I started this show because I wanted to cut through the BS of diet culture and fitness culture and actually learn from high achieving women at the top of their game who have figured out how to feel and perform their best at every stage of life. So I chat with experts, elite athletes, and leaders who have learned to succeed despite the massive gender data gap in exercise and medical science and product development. Every episode is filled with information, advice, and anecdotes that will help you fulfill your potential as an athlete, mom, leader, or business owner. And listen up. If you don't subscribe to our women's performance newsletter, you are definitely missing out. It's totally free. So head over to womensperformance.com and subscribe now. That's womensperformance.com. This podcast is a production of Feisty Media. Hey, Feisties. I was just reflecting uh, on some of the episodes we've had the last few weeks from Celine Yeager when we came back in the new year sharing the things she wished she'd known about perimenopause and menopause. I've got a lot of great feedback about that episode. So if folks haven't listened, uh, go back and check that one out. We had Vicki Crane, who made us think about sport broadly and what we want it to be in our society and how we want inclusion to look, which I think like that sounds like a big topic, but I think it can affect the way that we proceed with our everyday life and how we treat people in, in terms of like the things that we're involved in. For me, that would be a CrossFit, for example. Um, and then last week with Jordy Duncan chatting about free diving and what it does for her and her mental health. I I thought that was so relatable and so grateful to Jordy for being so open about her story. And after all of those those great episodes, I was thinking, where do we want to go next? And I wanted to create an episode that kind of goes back to the science. And so Millie and I have been reaching out to quite a few experts from sports science to exercise physiology. We have a couple of great episodes lined up to record, but nothing for this week. And so I went through, I went back through, you know, Feisty, some of you may not know that here at Feisty Media, we host all kinds of experts through a variety of events um, and through our online communities. So we've had virtual women's performance summits in 2021 and 2022. And often like when those events are over, I think it's a shame because those great talks that have been put together by an expert in their field just kind of like sit there in the back end of our platform. So I went back through some of them and listened to a number of the scientists that we had on. And I found this fantastic talk by Dr. Carrie Magali on exactly what we do and don't know about the menstrual cycle for sports performance. And it wasn't exactly what I remember this from the time when she presented it to it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be Carrie starts with a present her presentation with this review of the literature on women's performance and and as a former PhD student I love a good lit review so that we can actually assess what it is we do and don't know um, so she looks at the literature on women's performance at different stages of the menstrual cycle and then she shows us a couple studies about how athletes and their coaches are essentially woefully undereducated on how the menstrual cycle affects performance these are even some of the world's best best athletes and their coaches. And she also talks about athlete coach communication around all things menstruation, which as you can also probably imagine is not where it needs to be. Carrie herself holds a PhD in sports science and is associate professor at Mid Sweden University. She is also a senior researcher at the Sweden Winter Sports Research Center, and she's a competitive amateur multi-sport racer. Her talk is called Bloody Periods, Putting an End to the Taboo Era. And let's listen to that first. And then I'm going to jump back in with a few points that a few threads that I pull out from the conversation. Hi to everyone. Um, Thanks for coming into this room and um, yeah, it's great to be kind of invited in and have this opportunity to present. So um, just to welcome you all to my talk on bloody periods, so that's a bit of an English slant, uh, putting an end to the taboo era. 
As Lindsay said, I'm Dr. Kerry McGawley from the Swedish Winter Sports Research Center, and I'll jump straight into this one. So it has been documented that menstruation is a complex phenomenon that is perceived as an intimate and private matter, which makes women want to conceal the occurrence of menstrual bleeding. And let's face it, who hasn't done this at some point around the office or went up the pub with friends? And for me, this kind of summarizes this whole issue of taboo. But things do seem to be changing quite quickly and significantly uh, in research, sport, and also through social media, of course. And we are breaking this taboo. And the topic of female physiology and hormonal cycles, they are being highlighted and, and normalized, which, it, let's face it, it's such an important breakthrough and development for all of us. So, the focus of my talk today is to open up this conversation and to provide you with the most up-to-date research applications in this area with specific reference to these four points. So how the menstrual cycle affects athletic performance and health, insightful studies of athlete coach communication on this topic, practical ways to monitor and record menstrual and hormonal cycles, as well as ways that you can individualize your training plans with consideration to these cycles. Um, and then I was just going to do a quick overview of myself, but luckily you gave me a great um, kind of in, uh, intro, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Östersund, you said it almost perfectly. Um, it's a small city about 350 miles north of Stockholm in Sweden, so lots of snow and reindeer. I still work at the Winter Sports Research Centre, but I'm based in the UK, so I work remotely as a senior researcher, um, and I was the former director of that centre. You talked about me being a triathlete and a winter triathlete, so that's great. And obviously, I've got this um, kind of additional passion for cross-country skiing. So we're back in the game. Um, these are some of the women I'm privileged to work with on a regular basis. And uh, we're the hub for the Swedish biathlon and cross-country ski teams. So I work closely with our female and male athletes on a wide variety of applied sports science research projects. And at the moment, I'm leading on a specific female athlete project involving many of these women and others, which um, I'll touch on a bit later on. So to start with some of the effects of the menstrual cycle on performance and health, and I won't spend much time at all focusing on the physiology in this presentation, but I think it's important to remind ourselves of the key differences in sex hormones between women and men, because obviously we're not the same. So while all types of hormones are present in each sex, estrogens and progestogens are dominant in men, sorry, in women, <laughs> um, while androgens are obviously dominant in men, and concentrations of endogenous estrogens and progestogen, so those hormones that are naturally produced in our bodies, they fluctuate in normally menstruating, so eumenorrheic women, over the course of a menstrual cycle. And on the other hand, testosterone levels in men are relatively consistent from day to day. And from a practical perspective, it's important to appreciate that hormone levels vary both between and within individuals, meaning that any given hormonal milieu is not necessarily predictable. And also that physiological and psychological consequences are different for everybody. So the menstrual cycle doesn't affect every woman in the same way or even any given woman in the same way from month to month. You might have one cycle almost pass you by unnoticed and the next where you really just feel like death. Um, and here's a quick reminder of the hormonal cycle of a normally menstruating eumenorrheic woman. So our period starts on day one of the cycle and this is the early follicular phase characterized by low hormone levels and bleeding. And estrogen gradually increases and peaks when we're at our most fertile in the ovulatory phase mid-cycle. And in the luteal phase, progesterone, progesterone dominates and estrogen also remains relatively high. And I always used to get follicular and luteal muddled up uh, and could never remember which way around they go. So my cheat, which I sometimes still use today, I've marked on this uh, figure. Uh, follicular first, luteal last, that's my little cheat. And again, like I said, the focus of this talk is not physiology. So I'm going to jump straight on to how these hormonal fluctuations might affect performance. So the pre-ovulatory follicular phase is often referred to as anabolic, where planting the seeds for adaptation might have the greatest effects. 
And this is often considered to be in the form of high quality, high intensity, strength and endurance training. And on the other hand, the post ovulatory luteal phase is often referred to as catabolic and is the time for rest and recuperation in order to reap the benefits of the earlier work. And this is where lower intensity and longer duration exercise and recovery could be more important. Now, this graphic is from an online blog with a lot of really good practical tips about training across the menstrual cycle. And it's also written in more simple and digestible terms than a scientific article. But from my perspective as a researcher and educator, it's key to really read and understand and critique the original sources of the many claims about training according to the menstrual cycle, because it's really not as straightforward as it might seem. So I'm going to outline some of the latest state of the art research on this topic for you now. So Kelly McNulty and Kirsty Elliott Sale, two leading researchers in this field and well worth looking up and giving a follow on Twitter, by the way, um, have very recently together with their co-authors published this systematic review and meta-analysis entitled The Effects of Menstrual Cycle Phase on Exercise Performance in Eumenary Women. Um, now, for those of you who aren't so much into science, a systematic review and meta-analysis is our gold standard method of collating and presenting existing research evidence on a particular topic. So in this in-depth analysis, and obviously, if I was doing a normal presentation, this kind of information would come up slowly. So just kind of work your way through the slides because it's kind of a bit much all in front of you at once. But in this analysis, um, 78 original scientific articles were identified as being relevant. And the authors found that almost half of the existing studies, so 42%, offer only a low quality of evidence. So this is most often due to methodological limitations in the studies, such as low participant numbers or a lack of control, for example, for hormone levels. And it means that more studies of high quality are needed before we can really accept and have confidence in the conclusions that are made. But um, on the next point there, what these authors could conclude with confidence was that there might be a very, very small negative effect on performance during the early follicular phase. So from the onset of menstruation during bleeding. And this likelihood is statistically classified as trivial, which just means very small indeed. And also because the effect of menstrual cycle phase on performance was highly variable between studies, it's not possible to form a kind of consistent conclusion. And as such, the general guidelines on exercise performance across the menstrual cycle really couldn't be formed and weren't formed in, the, in this um, recommendation article. And instead, what the conclusion was that um, more high quality work is required in this space. And for now, we really need to be working with athletes individually around their symptoms and experiences. And remember, gold medals have been won and world records have been set at all stages of the menstrual cycle. So wherever you or your athletes may be come race or match day, for example, you, you still have all the tools to go out there and really smash out a best performance wherever you might be. Building muscle can be tough and gains can be so slow, even for those of us who do a lot of strength training. As an ex-endurance athlete who is now in perimenopause, I know this all too well. It can be frustrating to put in the time in the gym and not see the results I'm looking for. That's why it's super important to take the right supplements at the right time. One of those supplements is essential amino acids, which are needed to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein synthesis happens when you eat high quality protein like eggs or whey. And by supplementing with additional essential amino acids, you can make sure you are getting the full benefit of your training sessions. Targeted essential amino acid formulas can be up to four times more effective than just eating protein. I've been taking amino acids for almost a year, and in combination with eating quality protein and a couple other supplements, I have managed to turn the tides on age-related muscle loss, which starts at 30 for women, by the way, and I have continued to make strength gains as I head towards 50. AminoCo has been a longtime sponsor of Feisty Media and has supported 
all of our brands and podcasts over the years. I recommend starting with AminoCo Perform, and you can grab some at aminoco.com forward slash performance. If you enter the code performance, you will save 30% and receive a free gift if it is your first purchase. Give it a try and let me know how it goes. That's aminoco.com forward slash performance and use the code performance to save 30%. For decades, running shoes have been researched, tested, and designed for men. Brands have relied on the shrink it and pink it approach to sell male shoes to female customers. That's why we are so excited to be working with Hedda's. Hedda's designs athletic footwear for women that elevates performance, safety, and style. Hedda's unlocks the science behind women's biomechanics through dedicated research, creates better shoes for women that support their longevity and performance, and establishes new design standards to promote transparency in a male-biased industry. Hedda's have a lower ankle collar to reduce rubbing, a breathable mesh toe box to allow for ventilation and to allow for female toe shape, a special kind of plate in the midsole to keep tired legs going, a narrow heel cup to reduce heel slippage and take the pressure off our Achilles, and a rounded instep to create a snug fit. Hedda's has three shoe models designed for different sessions, the Alma Cruise for long runs, the Alma Tempo for training days, and the Alma Speed for pushing the pace. I've personally been running in the Alma Cruise and I love them. It's the shoe I always wanted and never knew I needed. The fit is perfect in every way. You can get your own pair of Hedda's at Hedda's.com and use the code FEISTY20 for 20% off. That's FEISTY20 at Hedda's.com and it will all be in the show notes. As a lifelong runner and triathlete turned CrossFitter, I am stoked to announce that the athletic eyewear brand Tofosi Optics has joined us as a partner here at Feisty Media. Tofosi sports glasses hit all the marks for athletes. They are shatterproof poly bicarbonate, so the lenses not only reduce glare, but also offer scratch resistance, which I 100% need. They stay in place when you are moving. The hydrophilic rubber nose pads actually get more grippy the more you sweat, so they are secure and don't slide down your face even when you're running in hot conditions. No matter what sport you do, Tofosi has shades for you. Whether you love tennis, fishing, pickleball, running, cycling, or just hanging out on the beach. They are super reasonably priced, which I love, so I can have multiple pairs that go with any outfit. And of course, feisty listeners get a special discount. So head on over to tofosioptics.com and use the code FM20. FM as in feisty media to get 20% off your order. That's FM20 at tofosioptics.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Now, we haven't got time in this talk to get into the details of hormonal contraceptive use and the effects on health and performance, but I did want to take this opportunity to provide a short summary. And you can see by the dotted and dashed lines on this figure that natural hormone levels are suppressed throughout the cycle when women use oral contraceptives, which are marked as OC in this diagram. And as a reminder of the basic physiology, oral contraceptives use exogenous forms of synthetic estrogens and progesterone to downregulate these hormone, normal hormonal fluctuations that we'd see. So there is no natural uh, menstrual cycle. And the bleeding that occurs within this cycle is known as a withdrawal bleed. Uh, and it's important to realize that that's not a period and it can't give us any information about normal menstrual function or whether you're eumenorrheic or not. So what about the effects on performance? Well, you'll recognize the authors on this paper as it's the partner paper to the previous one I showed you produced by the same research group. And in this systematic review and analysis, um, 42 original scientific studies were identified as being relevant with even fewer this time. So only 17% considered to be of high quality. 
And by the way, again, for those of you sort of not, not involved in science, um, the judgment of, of quality in these kinds of scientific papers isn't just a kind of half random subjective guess by the authors. There are actually recognized criteria and standard methods to categorize the, the quality of scientific studies that go into these papers. Um, so the authors could conclude that there seems to be a small tendency for performance to be affected by oral contraceptive use, but that we currently have too little knowledge to be able to provide general recommendations. And again, a personal, um, a personalized approach is recommended. And in terms of strength training specifically, this literature review focuses on the effects of resistance training throughout the menstrual cycle. And what this paper shows is that of the 17 studies included, and don't worry, this, this talk is not going to be a lo loads more of these reviews. This is the last one, in case you're panicking. Um, of the 17 studies included, one found no significant differences in the acute responses, so the immediate effects of, of completing a resistance training session across the different phases of the menstrual cycle. While on the other hand, four studies did find these kind of changes depending on menstrual cycle phase. And this means that in some cases, athletes responded differently to the resistance training stimulus, depending on where they were in their cycle. A slightly different focus, three studies reported that follicular phase-based training, so over the whole cycle, um, was superior to luteal phase-based training, while one study reported no differences, depending on how they trained. So again, there are conflicting findings and methodological limitations. And again, there's a need for further experimental studies in this area. Now, this graphic is from the same website I showed you previously, the same blog. And while the information is somewhat useful, it's also um, oversimplified as well. So four studies have kind of been cherry picked in a way to show you the results that the author wants to describe which is that strength was greatest around ovulation compared to the other phases of the menstrual cycle. But other studies showing opposite effects or showing no effect at all are overlooked and not included in, in this visual. And the interpretations on, on blogs and such like also tend to be inflated in order to provide simplistic and practical advice. And this is typical of, like I said, blogs or magazine articles or tweets um, because popular and social media typically push a particular narrative in order to create an interesting story and an impactful take home message. So my main message to you um, as a researcher and educator is to always be critical of what you read and make sure that you understand the original sources of evidence or at least interact with experts who do understand these types of nuances. So hopefully people like us at these kind of summits who really work in detail in specific areas. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is unfortunately really common in science. The more we learn, the more we realize what we don't actually know. Um, but on this topic, I, I think that there's a lot of hope for us because I feel like we as a scientific community, we've been to the top of Mount Stupid when it comes to women and, and training. And I feel like we've fallen into this valley of despair and now we're, we're, I'm pretty confident that we're on our way up again on the, on the slope of enlightenment. Um, I'm gonna change tack a little bit here. What I'd like to do now is to turn our attention to some of the work that we're doing with our elite, elite athletes in Sweden. And I'll present some published data on the perceptions of female athletes in relation to their performance and health across the menstrual cycle. So this scientific approach uh, differs from the studies that I've just talked about. What we're going to look at here is the information we get directly from athletes in relation to their feelings and experiences. So I'll hope, I hope that you'll be able to identify with this yourselves. Um, and in this study, we surveyed 24 of our national team cross-country skiers and biathletes on all things menstru menstrual cycle related using a 71 item questionnaire. And this is an illustration of the symptoms the athletes experience throughout their cycles. And I hope that you can read the red text, which is actually in English. Uh, some, some of it's in Swedish, but I've, I've translated the key terms, but I'll talk you through it. Um, you can see the number of women by the height of the bars, which are marked on the, the y-axis on the left, and the hormonal cycle symptoms 
they report are defined along the bottom on the x-axis. And the four cycles of the phases are illustrated on each bar by the different colours. So phase one marked in blue is during menstruation. Phase two marked in orange is um, the late follicular or ovulation phase. Phase three in grey is the early luteal phase. And phase four in yellow is premenstrual. So you can see that most of the symptoms are reported either during menstruation in blue or premenstrual in yellow. And the most commonly experienced symptoms, which were reported by 12 to 15 of our 24 women, were for lower back pain, stomach ache, mood swings, bloating and irritability, which I think just confirms that elite Swedish endurance athletes are only human after all and not that different from, from those of us who aren't kind of elite endurance athletes. And also in terms of health, we observed that nearly half of the group rep reported disappearance of menstrual bleeding during high volume training blocks. And a quarter of them reported the same outcome. So this disappearance um, of, of, of their periods during extended um, periods of high intensity training. And we'll come back to this idea a bit later because these are obviously really concerning statistics. Now, this is really busy, this slide. It wasn't going to be busy if it was presented to you kind of step by step. So just we'll take it step by step with each figure starting on the left hand side. Um, and as I prevent, present this information to you, I'd like you to think about how you or the women, the athletes that you work with might compare to our athletes and, and how this data is presented. So you can see from the chart on the far left, it's chart 2A that less than one third of our athletes, um, and that's marked in blue, actually monitor their cycle at all. And the lighter blue shows that only two of those athletes actually take note of their symptoms as part of their monitoring routine. And then marked in the sort of dark orange, the predominant color, um, you can see that two thirds of the athletes don't monitor their cycle at all. And that one final athlete in sort of light yellow there uh, she didn't know whether she did monitor her cycle or not. And that's obviously a bit of a worry for us from, from a whole nother perspective if she didn't actually know. <laughs> um, and then in the next chart, 2B, we um, uh, this one shows whether the athletes or coaches um, plan their training around their menstrual cycles. So you can see that this one was just a unanimous dark orange. No, none of them did. Um, in 2C, uh, so the third chart, we asked the athletes if they changed their training in the last year due to their menstrual cycle, and only one had in blue, uh, and that was on one to two occasions, but most of them hadn't, as you can see, marked in that dark orange colour again. And this is despite the common menstrual cycle symptoms and discomfort that the athletes reported, as I showed you on a previous slide. And then finally, in chart D there on the far right, um, this looks at knowledge so only one athlete felt that her coach um, had sufficient knowledge of the menstrual cycle. And that's again marked in blue, while the rest um, either felt that their coach didn't have enough knowledge or they didn't know if their coach had enough knowledge. And then just the last point on, in the text on the slide at the very bottom, in addition, only two of the women felt that they had enough knowledge themselves of how the menstrual cycle can affect training and performance. So hopefully from these results, um, I think you'd agree with me that we have quite a bit of work to do if we're going to get the absolute most out of our athletes and of ourselves. So I don't know how you fared um, as you thought about yourselves through that, but I believe that our results are a pretty good reflection of the general state of affairs amongst female athletes. And I don't think that met very many at all really have all of this nailed to the last detail. And... In support of my opinion here, this is a study by some colleagues of ours over the border in Norway, which was published last year, where 140 Norwegian skiers and winter biathletes were surveyed using the same questionnaire as the one that we used with our skiers. And remember, I, I appreciate that not everyone's a cross-country ski fanatic, so you can always apply these concepts to yourselves um, and your own sports. And in their study, the authors found that a high percentage of athletes reported menstrual cycle related symptoms, with these being most common during the bleeding and premenstrual phases, which is the same as we found. And again, the most common symptoms were stomach ache, bloating, lower back pain, mood swings, diarrhea and irritability. 
So Norwegian endurance athletes also seem to be quite similar to the rest of us in terms of period pains. And what about planning or changing training according to their menstrual cycles and perceptions of their own knowledge? And again, this is busy, so just take it step by step. Um, only 7% of the athletes plan their training according to their menstrual cycle. So again, very few. Um, around half of them, 52%, altered their training at least once due to the menstrual cycle related sort of side effects um, that had occurred during the previous year, while less than a quarter made changes more regularly, so more than three times in the year. And the most frequent reasons for altering training were stomach pain and lower back pain. Um, and similar to our findings, only 8% of the Norwegian women reported having sufficient knowledge about the menstrual cycle in relation to athletic training and performance. What about perceived performance? You can see on the left hand set of bars, so in this first um, larger red kind of box on the left hand side, that almost half of the group, so 42%, perceived that their best performance um, occurred during one of the four phases of the menstrual cycle. And in fact, the two weeks after bleeding, so those two middle cycle uh, phases, were considered the best for perceived performance compared to the other two phases. However, um, this sort of tall bar on the right hand side of the, the left panel that's marked 58%, that shows that more than half of the group perceived no change in performance across phases, or they didn't know if there was a difference or, or not. And if you focus on the right hand set of bars, that's kind of the same thing, but opposite, because that just relates to when they perceived their worst performance. Um, and half of the group, as you can see on the far taller right hand bar that's marked with 51%, um, felt no change in performance or didn't know when in the cycle they performed worse. So that's obviously very similar. Um, and then <clears throat> of these kind of middle bars in there, the other half identified one of the menstrual cycle phases being worse for, the, for performance. And that was most often during bleeding, so in phase one. So this is consistent with the McNulty review paper, which showed a very, very small negative effect on performance during the early follicular phase. And what you can actually really see from all of these kind of results on the whole, if you zoom out, is that once again, um, the, the perceptions amongst female athletes are really individualized. And really, the bottom line is that more than half of these women perceive no changes in performance throughout the menstrual cycle, or at least they didn't have a clear picture of when they felt in better or worse shape. So again, making generalizations just isn't appropriate. Most athletes will feel some symptoms at certain points in their cycles, but this might have no impact on performance at all. And it might vary from one cycle to the next, and it will certainly vary from one person to the next. What these studies also show us is just how little awareness we seem to have about our own bodies. Or if we have awareness about our bodies, we don't have that much knowledge at all about the kind of menstrual cycle and their effects. And probably this is certainly the case for me, but I think it's the case for most people. We haven't really been encouraged to track our periods and our symptoms and emotions from puberty. Sure, that's starting to happen now, but it's quite a recent thing. Um, and we also haven't been taught very much at all about sex specific physiology. So not even the best athletes in the world know what to do here. Um, and I really think that there's so much room for, for development. Now, it might seem like I haven't actually got very, through far my, uh, got very far through my program, even though I've taught for quite a while already. But rest assured, I've already touched on a lot of these next three topics. And what I want to do now is focus a bit more specifically on what we know about athlete coach communication and what we can do to open up the conversation even more. So the data we collected showed that we've still got quite a long way to go. Um, and what my research team and I are interested in now are the barriers to communication and the limits in knowledge and education that prevent women from fully understanding and optimizing their health, well-being, and performance. Um, and we can just have a kind of read, read through these and um, we'll just talk through this briefly together, but despite 22 of the 24 females having a male head coach, that didn't seem to be a big problem. Less than half of them actually felt it was difficult to talk to their coach about menstruation. And those who did just gave these kind of following reasons. They don't talk about it that much to anybody. They find it personal. Uh, don't think that anyone talks about it. 
they'd rather not talk about it or it's a taboo area and it doesn't feel natural. Um, however, the athletes did highlight to us that um, they'd like to know more about how the menstrual cycle affects their performance, more specifically, um, how they can adapt their training and recovery during their menstrual cycle to get the most out of their programs. And many of the athletes also want to know more about how the menstrual cycle affects health in general, such as the importance of having regular periods, how contraceptives affect mental health, likelihood of becoming pregnant, and then also about how energy balance affects the menstrual cycle. And again, our findings are backed up by other published data. So of the 140 Norwegian athletes that I previously introduced you to, less than a third of them, so only 27% discuss menstruation with their coaches. This percentage was, was larger if the coach was a woman. And in fact, they found the topic more difficult to approach if their coach was a man. And as with our study, they also reported it to be a private, taboo, uncomfortable or embarrassing subject in general. And let's not forget, these are highly developed sports federations in famously kind of liberal countries. And Norway's the best in the world, unfortunately for, for me as a, as a Swede, Swedish worker, at both cross-country skiing and biathlon. And the athletes here that we're talking about that are national superstars, yet their systems are still quite basic from a female athlete perspective. And before we get on to the, the last couple of topics, and again, we, don't, we won't go into too much detail there, so it's all good. I just want to um, briefly show you one other study uh, by Finlay and colleagues. And here, a group of 15 elite rugby players were interviewed. And I won't go into too much detail, like I said, but the authors, again, highlighted individual responses to menstrual issues. OK, so, so yeah, these authors proposed a need for clinicians, support staff, to undertake menstrual cycle monitoring and profiling. Uh, they highlighted a need to develop awareness, openness, knowledge and understanding of the menstrual cycle. So things that we've been talking about, really. And um, these athletes were part of a national team setup, which I realise that many of you won't be. But even in the absence of external resources, um, the principles are the same. We all have a need for far more education in this area. We need to monitor our bodies and communicate with others about our experiences in order that we can all share information and learn from one another. Um, in this study, the authors propose a model for practical use. Um, I think I'll just give you a couple of seconds to have a look at this and digest it, but literally just kind of spin round. It's not rocket science again. Um, but yeah, like if we'd had a bit more time, you could have kind of maybe digested that in a little bit more detail. But there, there's a reference there if you kind of want to look into that. You'll be able to pick up that model if you wanted to. And just to wrap up this uh, topic of communication, I wanted to share with you some of our most recent findings from the national team coaches that we work with. Um, and they felt that the athletes rarely address the issue of hormonal cycles that, you know, we're happy to talk about it, but the athletes just don't bring it up. Um, and the coaches said that they don't have a problem talking about female specific issues, but they experience uncertainty about how or when to address the topic, as well as what to do or say. They aren't, they're not necessarily sure where their coaching role stops and when other experts should take over. They're not sure who they can send their athletes to. And they also are worried about losing insight into their athletes' health if they send their athletes away to a, to a different person. The coaches find it difficult to plan training in relation to menstruation because they lack the tools to be able to translate research into practice. They appreciate that there are large individual differences between athletes, and they feel it's unclear whether potential changes would really positively affect performance or not. And then they also highlight amenorrhea as, as being a dilemma because for these athletes to get their period back would require reduced exercise volume and eating more. Um, but this is a weight bearing endurance sport requiring high training volumes and low, low body mass. So this is obviously a dilemma here. Now, it's problematic. And I mentioned earlier the loss of menstruation in a number of our athletes. And amenorrhea is concerning for a number of reasons that we're not going to go into detail with here, but I just wanted to highlight this example. A research paper that I'm a co-author of was recently featured in the Canadian Running Magazine earlier this month. And in this study, we showed uh, eumenorrheic runners to improve their performance over a com competition season compared to their amenorrheic peers. And the eumenorrheic runners 
were also less injured and they could train more as a result. So this is great news because it sends out a really positive message to female athletes, stay healthy and you can compete better. And the opening line of that magazine article stated that there was a time not too long ago when a female athlete losing her period was considered a good thing. It meant she was fit, training hard and at the top of her game. Now, to me, in an ideal world, this would be a thing of the past. But if we're honest, this thinking still goes on today and we have a long way to go. So a lot more widespread education is really required before these beliefs will disappear for good. Um, but I'm hopeful that we're, we're on the right path. So <clears throat> I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes of this talk just summarising my final two points, because, uh, like I said, we've covered quite a few parts of them. And the main message on ways to monitor and record menstrual hormonal cycles is also that it is not rocket science. And to once again steal the wisdom of Kirsty Elliott Sale, there's a simple track and respond menstrual cycle mantra that's easy to follow and effective. And that is to simply note when you start and stop bleeding, note down how heavy your bleed is. If number three is relevant for you, then you might want to check ovulation using a commercially available kit, for example. But you can always note any symptoms during your cycle, especially just before your period. And then these final two points really relate to individualizing your training. And here you would respond to any feelings or symptoms that occur during your cycle and build a profile up of your experiences and your performance and health. And this schematic outlines a similar kind of process as an alternative, and it's a nice summary of how to approach the problem, I think. So firstly, the warm up, um, learn as much as you can about tracking, basically. And then in play, they talk about start collecting data. And then the post game review, after a few cycles, you can start to review your data and look for any patterns and make reasonable adjustments. And I just want to point out that the period of the period is a really good platform, educational platform for all things women's health and performance related, um, which is led by Kelly McNulty, who I've referred to a couple of times before. Um, so I'd recommend following this one on Twitter as well if you don't already. There are obviously a range of apps on the market which might help you keep track of your cycle characteristics. And these are a few good examples, but the key is to keep things simple and manageable. If an app becomes burdensome, then you'll be far less likely to use it. On the other hand, if it streamlines and helps you to organize your data collection, then for sure, go for it. That's, that's also quite an individual kind of situation. But of course, do be wary of these generic kind of recommendations that might pop up that really aren't evidence based and quite often aren't synced with your performance needs either. So being told to take it easy on the couch with a hot water bottle isn't necessarily what you need if you have a five hour ride in your program and you feel completely fine. OK, so that brings us to our last point, and um, I've actually already touched on this point many times throughout my talk. So I'm just going to summarize the key practical actions here. We often say that there is no magic recipe and it's almost always true unless you see doing the simple things consistently right as being magic, because that's most often what what it does take. So what my advice to you is to continuously analyze your cycle and symptoms which most often is subjective feelings that nobody else could, could tell you about. They're your own feelings. You'd identify patterns over time, so over your menstrual cycles, and then make your own adjustments. Communicate openly with others. So I've showed you lots of evidence now that that really is not going on to a very high degree. So we need to open up this conversation. And don't expect your situation to be comparable to anybody else's, whether it's better, worse or the same. You just need to focus on, on you. And understanding your own hormonal cycle and being prepared to make these small, small adjust, adjustments, that is going to make a difference for you personally. So the key take home messages of this talk today there is currently not enough high quality evidence to be able to recommend a generic optimal strategy for female athletes training across a typical menstrual cycle, unfortunately. Much more research and education are required to be able to make informed decisions about training according to the menstrual cycle. Regular and open communication is going to help us to break this taboo, both for ourselves, but also for the, the youngsters coming up. 
You can monitor your own or your athlete's menstrual cycle and related symptoms and generate this database of information that can help guide individual training and recovery programs. And then a personalized approach is essential. And remember, no matter where you are in your cycle, a best performance is always going to be possible. I would just like to thank Dr. Carrie Magali again for this presentation from 2021. A few things stood out to me. One, the most important one I think is that because the research is so new and there are so few studies, we need to be careful about drawing conclusions quickly. So we're still in a phase where we should be, as women, we should be listening to our bodies and learning what's best for us as individuals. I also absolutely love the reminder that gold medals have been won at every stage of the menstrual cycle, not because I'm planning on winning any gold medals, um, but because it frees me from some of the negative talk that I hear around me. And frankly, that also lives in my head about what I can and can't do or how I might or how I might feel at certain times of the month. And I'm super excited about the future, mostly because there is so much that we don't know. And that means we have endless potential to learn and improve women's performances and overall health over the coming years, especially as more studies, more time, more money is being pumped into new initiatives in women's health and performance. And that is truly exciting. As we head into summer, rest and recovery are critical for improving sports performance, reducing stress, and living a long and healthy life. We should all invest in better sleep. So think about the thing you lay your head on for eight hours a night. If it's not exactly right for you, it can lead to needless tossing and turning, or worse, have you waking up with an unrelenting kink in your neck. My new Lagoon pillow has helped me improve my sleep immensely by pairing me with the performance pillow that has everything I need. So I personally was matched with the Otter pillow, shout out to Team Otter, which I love because it has a gentle cooling effect. And I was able to choose how much stuffing I wanted in it, which is super important to me because I'm doing a decent amount of CrossFit these days and my shoulders are kind of creaky. So having a pillow that is stuffed just to the right height keeps my neck and head in exactly the right position and comfortable for the entire night. And as of fall 2023, Lagoon launched their 100% mulberry silk pillowcases. It's cool to the touch, buttery soft, and great for your skin and hair. You've got to go check out this pillowcase if you want to feel great and look great every morning. Waking up for morning workouts has never felt better. I'm refreshed and pain-free thanks to my Lagoon pillow. To check it out for yourself, go to lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance and take the two-minute sleep quiz to find your perfect pillow match and then use the code PERFORMANCE for 15% off your first purchase. That's code PERFORMANCE at lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance, whole 15% off, and the link is in the show notes. You can just click through there. Endurance sports should be accessible to everyone, right? That's why we are so excited to be partnering with Motive. Motive is one of the fastest growing training apps in the world today with thousands of amateur athletes signing up every month and a nearly perfect 4.9 star rating in the app store. You are not a template and your training plan should not be either. Prepare for running races, triathlons, cycling events, duathlons, or swim runs, however your season schedule shapes up, and get training written by some of the best coaches in the world in each discipline who know what it takes to help amateur athletes reach their goal on race day. The app takes the training written by those experts and then creates the most optimal training plan for your schedule, abilities, and goals. 
Plus, the training is fully customized to your race schedule. How much you can train each week, your current abilities, and the goals you want to achieve in your race. You can use the app for free as long as you want or get all the upgraded features from the app for just $19.99 a month. But as a feisty listener, you can sign up at mymotive.com and use the code FEISTY for two months of full premium access. That's right, you get two months of premium for free. So you quite literally have nothing to lose. So head over to mymotive.com, M-Y-M-O-T-T-I-V.com and use the code FEISTY, F-E-I-S-T-Y. And on a personal note, I know the founder of Motive and he is driven to make triathlon and all endurance sports more accessible for the athletes who care about their performance, but who aren't quite ready for a full-time personal coach. If that sounds like you, definitely try the app for two months for free. You literally have nothing to lose.